So we're going to look at how to structure a 16 marker. So this will be your extended writing question or the essay question that you will have in your exams. So you need to be aware of the three types of 16 markers that might come up. There's ones regarding studies, ones in explanations and theories, and one is an application based essay. So let's have a look at the study type questions then. So examples is outline and evaluate Ash's research. To describe and evaluate two studies of social influence. Now, you may also see the word discuss. Now remember discuss means both outline and evaluate. So don't just fall into the common trap of just writing your AO1, just your description. Remember to include evaluation. Also importantly to remember that now in A level you have more weighting given to the evaluation. So it's weighted 6 marks AO1, 10 marks AO3. So you should be spending the majority of your time on your evaluation. So if we take the outline and evaluate Ash's research for example, what I would do is I would describe the aims, the procedure, so about three to four key points about the procedure. Mm -hmm. Try and use key figures and facts in there to show the examiner you really understand your stuff. The findings, so one to two th um, key findings and the conclusions, so write down the conclusions of the study. Now when we are evaluating research and studies, use the acronym GRAVE to help you if you can't remember the specific evaluation points that you have. So can we generalise the findings? Is there anything that is preventing us from generalising the findings? Is it reliable? Are there any applications of the research? Also think about linking that to psychology and the economy. Is it valid and are there any ethical concerns? So if I was to plan my essay, it might look something a little bit like this. I'm not expecting you to do as detailed a plan in the exam, but it is important to plan um, if you run out of time, for example, the examiner will look at your plan. Now, it's not going to help you get full marks, but it may get you one or two extra marks, okay? As long as you don't cross anything out, the plan may give the examiner uh, a bit more of an idea of where you were heading, and you might have some evaluation points that you hadn't quite gotten round to. So I'm going to mention the aims. I've picked out my four key facts, so it was 123 male students. They were shown a card with a reference line and three other lines. They had to say which are the three lines, A, B or C, was closest to the reference line in length. They competed 18 trials and on the 12 uh, critical trials the Confederates gave a wrong answer. And then going to mention the two key findings. So real participants conformed on 32% uh, of the critical trials and 74% conformed at least once. So it suggests that individuals will conform to a majority even when wrong, so supporting the idea of normative social influence. Now, if we're going to look at our acronym of GRAVE, this might help me if I'm a little bit stuck or it might act as a little bit of a, uh, a cue for me in the exam. So can we generalise it? probably not, it's, it lacks population validity, so it's only done on men, so it's androcentric, try and use those keywords, only done in America, so ethnocentric. Reliable, well it is reliable, can we repeat it? Yes, because it's a lab experiment, strictly controlled, so increasing the reliability. Any applications, so if we think about social uh, change, we can use majority influence in social change for health campaigns. And then we can extend that further by saying that would improve the economy by reducing the burden on the NHS. Is it valid? Well, a lab experiment controls the extraneous variables, so therefore very high internal validity. However, because of that strict control, it lacks ecological validity. So remember, if we can include a counter argument in one of our evaluation points, you are showing the examiner that there is um, no necessarily black or white within psychology, there's areas of grey. So yes, there may be a strength to a lab experiment, but there's also a weakness. Ethical issues, yes, they were deceived about the task. Also, they might have experienced distress. Some of them became quite uneasy having to give an answer. 
Okay, so this is an example of how it could be written in the bits in bold are the key facts, the key bits that I planned. Obviously, I've extended the evaluation. So in 1951, Ash conducted research into majority influence. I'm then going to explain what majority influence is to show the examiner I understand my keywords. So this is when behaviours or beliefs of a large group influences the behaviours and beliefs of a smaller group. The aim of his research was to establish the extent that majority can affect individual conformity. Could have extended that further by explaining what conformity was. 123 male students from colleges in the US took part. They were divided into groups and seated around a table. They were shown a card which had a reference line drawn on it and another card which had three label lines. Each participant had to say publicly which of these was closest to the reference line. Each participant completed 18 trials. On 12 critical trials, the confederate, an actor who participates in psychological experiment pretending to be a subject, but in actuality is working for the researcher, gave the wrong answer. Ash found that the real participant conformed on 32% of the critical trials and 74% conformed at least once during the research. It was concluded that a majority group exerts a strong influence on conformity and individuals were willing to conform even when the majority was wrong. So normative social influence. So that's all my AA1. I'm now going to go into my AA3. So remember to signpost your evaluation. Examiners are very busy people. Make it really clear that you're moving from AO1 to AO3. So use your sentence starters. A strength of the research is that it has high internal validity. So that's my point in my PL paragraph. For example, the research was carried out in a controlled environment and used standardised procedures. This means that the findings are more likely to be down to the manipulation of the independent variable rather than any extraneous variables confounding the result. This is a strength because it increases the internal validity of the research, therefore the results and conclusions drawn are likely to be valid. So I've concluded that nicely. I'm now going to include my counter argument, so the negative about a lab experiments. However, due to the strict control over the environment and artificial nature of the task, it means that it may not explain majority influence in everyday life because it lacks ecological validity. Therefore, we should be cautious when applying the findings to an external setting and it weakens the conclusions drawn from the research as it may not be representative of real life. I could um, write that as a separate evaluation point. However, writing two evaluation points about it being a lab experiment is not necessarily showing the examiner you have a breadth of knowledge. Um, by including both in one paragraph, you're showing that you have that depth of knowledge. Another strength of this research is led to real world applications. For instance, the use of majority influence in the development of health campaigns. For example, if university students think that heavy drinking is the norm, they'll drink more. If they think responsible drinking is the norm, they'll drink less, i.e. they'll conform. The development of social norms and interventions can help the economy because it will reduce the impact on the NHS and health services. This demonstrates the importance of psychological research in our society. So remember, try to always include that link sentence. You're always coming back to it. So why that is a strength or why it is a weakness. Now I'm making clear that I'm going on to my um, weaknesses. So I would always try and do my strengths together and my weaknesses together. Don't chop and change between the two. Don't necessarily start doing a weakness and a strength and back to a weakness. Try to write them in separate paragraphs. A disadvantage of this research is the sample is biased. This is because the sample was used was androcentric, only done on males. Furthermore, it is ethnocentric, only done in America. Therefore, it would be beta bias to apply the findings to females in other cultures, as there may be important differences in conformities between males and females, and between individualistic and collectivist cultures. This weakens the findings and conclusions of research because it lacks population validity, and therefore might not be applicable to everyone. So I'm trying to be synoptic there. I'm using keywords from the issues and debates, so beta bias 
We've used that when we've studied issues and debates to try to make sure that you include them in your paper one section. Finally, a weakness of Asher's research is that it's ethno, eth, ethically questionable. Sorry, He deliberately deceived the participants, saying they were taking part in a vision test. However, the experiment required deception in order to achieve valid results and reduce any demand characteristics. Furthermore, many of the participants reported feelings of stress when they disagreed with the majority, indicating that Ash did not protect his participants from harm. This highlights the importance of following ethical guidelines within research. Okay, so don't be tempted to write an introduction and a conclusion within your extended answers. You don't have time. This is 16 marks. You have 30 minutes per section. So it's a two hour exam, four sections for you to write in paper one and paper three. You simply won't have time to include a conclusion and an introduction. Just get straight to your answer. Explanations and theories, okay? So how are we gonna tackle these ones? So for example, you might have describe and evaluate social learning theory on human aggression, discuss biological explanations for schizophrenia. So remember you've got discuss there, that means outline and evaluate, discuss the role of genetic factors in aggression. Also, be aware that AQA can use the term research, and that means explanations and theories, as well as studies. So, for example, it could be describe and evaluate research into social learning theory and human aggression. So that means you can discuss social learning theory as an explanation. If it was to say describe and evaluate research studies, then you know that you can only talk about research studies. If it uses just the word research you can go down the route of describing studies or you can go down the route of describing the explanation and theory behind it. So we're going to look at the describe and evaluate the social learning theory of human aggression. So your AO1, I would give the definition of the theory or explanation to show the examiner you understand. Also might help you get grounded in your extended essay. Three key AO1 points in paragraph one and three key, A, key AO1 points in paragraph two. I would always try to aim to have two AO1 paragraphs. Then to help us with our evaluation, if you get stuck, if you can't remember the key evaluation points, use the acronym SCOUT to help you. So is there any supporting evidence, conflicting evidence? Are there any other explanations? Is it useful and is it testable? Now a really easy evaluation point if you get stuck is the other explanations. So you've learned all the other explanations of human aggression, so use them in evaluation point. Be kind on yourself, reduce the amount that you have to try and remember. Also, with the supporting evidence, if you know a key feature of the methodology behind that, you could include a counter argument about why that supporting evidence might not be valid or reliable. Okay, so if we knew it was an independent group's design, we could talk about the results might be down to individual differences rather than being in the two different conditions. So, if I was to plan this, I'm going to say that learning aggression through observation and imitation of the role model, that is what social learning theory is. I'm going to mention my three key points, so meditational processes on vicarious reinforcement, and then three key points on the identification and Bandura's research. Now Bandura's research can be used as AO1 or AO3. Now it all depends how you word the research. So I'm going to use it as AO1, so I'm just going to talk about uh, what his aims, the key um, features of the process, the procedure, findings and conclusions. If I wanted to use his research as my supporting evidence, I'd simply say a strength of social learning theory is there a supporting evidence found by Brandura. It was found that when children witnessed 
a adult be aggressive towards a baby doll, they were more likely to be aggressive themselves. Therefore, this supports the claims that we model and imitate aggressive behaviour. So my supporting evidence is going to be that it can be used to explain the cultural differences in aggression. So the Kunsan of the Kalahari Desert display low levels of aggression. Now, my conflicting evidence, I haven't really got any conflicting evidence, so I'm not going to talk about that. Now, these acronyms are just to help you trigger you to your um, use evaluation points and a, and a variety of evaluation points. They're not always going to fit, so don't try and shoehorn an evaluation point in. Try and make them relevant and key. Other explanations, so compare it to the biological approach, doesn't take into account the MAOA gene or low levels of serotonin that could be the cause of aggression. Is it useful? So yes, there are some applications of the research. So Phillips found that daily homicide rates increased a week following a major boxing match, so suggesting that we do learn aggression. Um, testable, well, can we test it? Because actually exposing children to aggressive behavior and we know that they might repeat it is ethical. Um, so therefore we're no longer allowed to do this. So actually can we test social learning theory and aggression? So here I've gone down. This is an example of how you could structure it. So social learning theory of aggression assumes that behavior is learned through observation and imitation of role models. The theory claims that full meditational processes are work in order for aggression to be learned. So remember, relate it explicitly to aggression. Attention, so a personal child must attend to the aggressor. So the child must pay attention to an act of aggression carried out by a role model. Retention, a child needs to remember the aggression that they have witnessed, reproduction, the individual needs to be able to reproduce the behaviour, i.e. they have the same physical capabilities, e.g. aggression displayed by superheroes is less likely to be imitated if the child does not possess the physical capabilities to actually carry out the behaviour. Motivation. A child must expect that they will get some kind of reward from carrying out aggression. This doesn't have to be materialistic, but could be linked to gaining higher status in the eyes of their peers. The individual doesn't need to gain direct reinforcement. However, it's important that they witness the role model being rewarded by vicarious reinforcement for the aggression. So I've been really explicit in relating social learning theory to aggression. So don't simply describe social learning theory. Remember to link it to the question. Identification is more likely to happen if the role model is similar to the individual in age or gender or in a position of power, so for example a parent or teacher. The observer needs to have a level of self-efficacy, so self-confidence in their ability to replicate the behaviour. For instance, in Bandura's research, children who had witnessed the adult of the same gender being aggressive to the baby doll behaved the most aggressively towards the doll. I'm now moving into my evaluation, so remember, separate paragraphs from my different points. I'm extending on them, I'm following the peel format, I'm making it really clear by using my signposting. The strength of this explanation is it can explain cultural differences in aggression. The Kunsang of the Kalahari Desert display low levels of aggression. For example, when children fight or argue, they are not rewarded or punished, they are separated and their attention is distracted by other things. Also, adults do not use physical punishment and aggressive postures. Therefore, there is an absence of direct reinforcement and role models. This supports the theory's claims that observation leads to imitation of aggression. Another advantage is there are practical applications of the theory. For instance, Phillips found that daily homicide rates in the US almost always increase the week following a major boxing match. This could suggest this is because viewers are intimidating behaviours they watched. As a result, extra police forces could be present in the weeks following aggressive sporting acts. This demonstrates the importance of psychological research in society. Now I could extend that evaluation point even further by including some links to psychology in the economy. I could also um, include a counter argument that this research was only done in the US. 
so perhaps it might not explain or be uh, applicable to other cultures. A weakness of testing social learning theory is there are ethical issues. By exposing children to aggressive behaviour with the knowledge that they may reproduce it in their own behaviour raises moral considerations. Therefore, experiments no longer allowed. Consequently, it's difficult to test the experimental hypothesis about social learning theory and aggressive behaviour and to establish scientific credibility. Furthermore, another weakness, the theory is environmentally reductionist. For example, it focuses on external stimulus it does not take into account any internal biological factors. Both the MAOA gene and low levels of serotonin have been associated with high levels of aggression. This weakens the theory as it suggests that it doesn't offer a full explanation of human aggression. So again, I'm using some key words that I've learned from issues and debates. When we are um, talking about another explanation, don't be tempted to go into masses of detail about the other explanation. So don't give me loads of information about the MAO gene or low levels of serotonin. Application questions, okay? So these are ones where you will have a scenario given to you. So for example, a woman is being questioned by a police officer about a heated argument she witnessed on an evening out with friends. The argument took place in a bar and ended with a violent assault. A knife was discovered later by the police in the car park of the bar. Did you see the knife the attacker was holding? Asked the police officer. I'm not sure there was a knife. Yes, there probably was, replied the woman. I was so scared that at the time that it's hard to remember and my friends and I have talked about what has happened so many times since that I'm almost not sure what I did see. So that's our scenario. The question is, discuss research into two or more factors about the effects of reliability of eyewitness testimony. Refer to the information above in your answer. So remember, discuss means outline and evaluate. We've been given some key information there, so two or more. So we know that we need to talk about at least two factors. And here we've got the word research. So this is an example of where we can use research studies and um, our theories and explanations behind this. So we should remember from memory that we have different factors that can affect eyewitness testimony. So I would write them as separate evaluate, um, separate paragraphs. So don't be tempted to write AO2, so that's your application in with your AO1. I would write them as separate paragraphs. So describe the explanation, theory or factors in one paragraph. Then do a separate paragraph on your AO2, so using quotes from the scenario, and then do your AO3. Now because this question asks for two or more, I would do the AO1 of one factor, the AO2 and the AO3 of that factor, then do AO1, AO2, AO3 because that will help you link it back and also the advantage of doing it that way is if you run out of time in the exam you have still included your AO2 and AO3 you haven't just focused on AO1. So here's my plan I've got the three factors so linking back I know that leading questions post-event discussion and anxiety and weapon focus are the three factors that can influence eyewitness testimony. Leading questions, the question that suggests either by form or content the desired answer. Leading questions can contain misleading pieces of information or words that are usually closed and I'm going to discuss Loftus and Palmer's study. Now linking to the scenario, was there a leading question? Yes there was. Did you see the knife the attacker was holding? Then I also need to explain how that will affect her eyewitness testimony so it will reduce her accuracy. So evaluation of leading questions is real world application to so the development of the cognitive interview and it lacks population validity. The study was only done on students. Post event discussion. So that's a conversation between co-witnesses that might affect her memory. So we could have memory cont contamination or memory conformity. 
Have we got an example of that? Yes, I have. My friends and I have ha talked about what had happened so many times I'm always not sure what I did see. And remember to link back to how that will affect her eyewitness testimony so it will reduce her accuracy and reliability. However, it lacks mundane realism. They watched a film of crime, so therefore it's not representative of witnessing a real crime. The other factor, anxiety. So we can talk about how anxiety could have a negative impact, particularly if there's a weapon. So remember, they focus on the perif um, on the central details, so on the weapon rather than the peripheral details. So that's Johnson and Scott's study. I could also talk about the positive effects of anxiety. So how being anxious could increase the reliability. So linking it back, though I was so scared at the time, so we could talk about how it could increase or decrease her accuracy. Most studies are lab-based, therefore they have high internal validity. The advantages of planning like this is that a lot of these studies will have very similar evaluation points and I don't want to make use the same evaluation points for more than one. So if I'm talking about the anxiety, their studies tend to be lab-based. I don't want to mention the, a lab-based study for Loftus and Palmer or for the post-event discussion. I want to show the examiner that I have more than just an understanding of strengths and weaknesses of a lab experiment. Now, in the example I'm given, I'm only going to focus on two. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail. You could mention all three factors and therefore you'd go in less detail. It's up to you to think about which would be the most beneficial way for you to write this. So my first factor I've got in purple, then I've got my linking it back to the application in blue and then my evaluation. So one factor that could influence the accuracy of eyewitness testimony is leading questions. A leading question is a question that either by form or content suggests a desired answer or leads a witness to believe there is a desired answer. Leading questions contain misleading information or words and they are usually closed. Loftus and Palmer carried out research on 45 students who'd watched a video of a car accident. They were given questions about what they had witnessed. On the critical question, how fast were the cars going when they... the verb was changed. Those who had the word smashed estimated a higher speed than the other groups, above 41 miles per hour, and the group that were given the word contacted estimated a lower speed, so about 30 miles per hour, suggesting leading questions reduce the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Now, I could have gone into a lot more detail, but remember I need to describe at least two factors. So I need to reduce the amount of information that I would include. So I've only picked out about three key AO1 points there from the first factor. An example of a leading question was when the woman was asked, did you see the knife the attacker was holding? This implies that there was a knife and it will reduce her accuracy as she is more likely to answer that she did see a knife because that is what the question is suggesting. So remember my application, I need to be explicit in how that factor will affect her eyewitness testimony. A strength of the research is that led to important real world application because leading questions can have such a distorting effect on memory that police officers need to be careful how they phrase their questions when interviewing the eyewitness. Research into eyewitness testimony has led to the development of the cognitive interview. This has impacted on the economy because police forces are now able to gather more detailed and accurate information compared to a standard interview. However, a limitation of the study is that it lacks population validity. This is because it was only conducted on students. There is evidence that older people are less accurate when giving eyewitness testimony. It was found that people in the group 55 to 78 years were less accurate in recall than 18 to 25 and 35 to 45. Therefore, the conclusions that leading questions can affect an eyewitness testimony might not be accurate for all ages and could have even more of an impact on older participants. I'm now moving on to my second factor. Another factor that can influence eyewitness testimony is post-event discussion. This is a conversation between a co-witness and other people or an interviewer and an eyewitness after a crime has taken place, which contaminates the witness memory of the event. So Gabba Tatel studied participants in pairs. Each participant watched a video of the same crime but filmed from different points of view. 
This meant that each participant could see elements of the event, but not all of it. Both participants discussed what they had seen before individually completing a test of recall. They found that 71% of participants mistakenly recalled aspects of the event that they did not see in the video, but had picked up in the discussion. In the control group, 0% of the participants mistakenly recalled aspects of the event. It was concluded that post-event discussion reduces the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. That's my AO1. Now going to my AO2. This is seen when the woman states, my friends and I have talked about what happened so many times since that I'm almost not sure what I did see. This could lead to memory conformity where one friend reports the crime could influence her report, reducing the accuracy of her eyewitness testimony. I could also mention that there could be uh, memory contamination there. So um, her memory has become distorted by information that she has discussed. A weakness of this study is that it lacks mundane realism. This is because the task that artificial, such as watching a film of a crime, is very different to witnessing a real accident because the clips lack the stress of a real incident. This tells us very little about how misleading information can affect eyewitness testimony in cases of real crimes or accidents, therefore weakening the claims that post-event discussion reduces the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So. Remember with application questions, your AO1 is still worth six marks, or well, that's the weighting of your AO1. Your AO2 is worth about four marks, and your AO3 is reduced to six marks. So you don't need to necessarily write the same amount of AO3 that you would normally write within 16 markers. So as I said, within a 16 marker, I would aim to write two AO1 paragraphs and three to four fully elaborated peel paragraphs or paragraphs with a counter argument in them. If you are not particularly strong at doing peel paragraphs then I would suggest that you drop it down to a point evidence explain and do about five evaluation points. So there's more than one way that you can tackle a question, these are just some guidance for you.